today I'm going to tell you three stories. Um, my background is in mind, brain, and education. I was a high school science teacher, and um, you know how it goes. They say, hey, can you also teach neuroscience? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, but I had read some Oliver Sacks. Have any of you read Oliver Sacks? And some Ramachandran. And these are um, some amazing neuroscientists who tell stories of individuals who really defied their expectations of what they thought they could do neurologically. And they're fabulous stories. I've linked their books in the slides if you end up wanting some good reading. Um, Oliver Sacks and Ramachandran. So I'm going to share three stories that really stood out for me when I first read them as like, whoa, that really defied my expectation of what I thought the brain could do. So I was really immersed in trying to learn neuroscience, trying to learn about the brain. And it was through reading these extreme stories that I felt like I really started to understand the brain in a really powerful way that I think is really important when we think about about students and their own learning and what they're capable of in our classrooms. So you're ready for, and I love a good story. How many of you love a good story? <laughs> so this first story is about um, a woman named Cheryl who was described as a wobbler. So she was 37 when she received an antibiotic for a routine hysterectomy. And unfortunately, the dosage of the antibiotic wasn't quite right and it destroyed these little tiny hairs that are on the inside of your ear. So if this is your, ooh, that's the, uh, if this is your ear, you go in and there, there are these semicircular canals and there are these teeny tiny little hair cells in there. And those are the little hair cells that got destroyed. And when they're destroyed, it turns out like even to be able to sit upright, like you're all sitting upright right now, relies on these tiny inner hair cells. They interact with our visual field. They interact with the proprioceptors, which are all in our skin. And without these, Cheryl literally couldn't stand. She would have to cling to walls to try to stand up. She couldn't work anymore. She couldn't leave her house. The condition was permanent. There was no cure. Imagine this, right? Devastating. But fortunately, amazingly, she came into contact with this neuroscientist, Baki Rita, and he basically developed this construction hat style apparatus that had this strip of electrodes connected to it. And she would put it in her mouth and it basically made a little fizzy sensation. You know when you put um, like some sparkling water in your mouth and it fizzes? So anytime, and, and it was like a little circle. So anytime she would start to lean to the right, she would feel the little fizzies go to the right and she would have to try to level and keep the little strip centered in her tongue. So any direction she would move, she would literally start to shift. And after about 30 minutes of, of practicing with that, she was able to stand for the first time in five years un, unaided. And the story goes that she kind of skipped around in her socks a little bit. She was that excited. And what was even more amazing is the longer she wore the hat, the longer she could start to keep her balance after she took it off. So she would kind of have this residual. So she would wear it for an hour, balancing, working really hard to keep the fizzy strip in the middle of her tongue. And then she would have a couple hours of residual time that she could fully walk and participate. Then it would get up to days. And after a year, she didn't need the strip anymore. Her tongue had figured out how to do the job of her inner ear hair cells. <sighs> right? <laughs> Don't you just want to cheer? It's been 20 years and she still does not need the apparatus. She is a walk, like if she walked by now, we would not know she didn't have those little tiny inner ear hair cells uh, destroyed. So amazing, right? Totally defied expectations. So the tongue has thousands of neurons. They go to the brain, the tiny hair cells, they have neurons, they go to the brain. The brain needs, you know, wants you to balance and it figured out a new way. It figured out a new way. The second story is from Oliver Sacks. It's a story called The Man Who Fell Out of Bed. And, um, and so in this story, it starts out and a gentleman is sleeping in the hospital. He had gone in earlier that day because his leg felt numb. He couldn't figure out why his leg felt numb. Well, in the middle of the night, he woke up just disgusted because he thought someone had put a severed leg in the hospital bed. And I'm going to read you a quote from the story. Then he found someone's leg in the bed a severed human leg, a horrible thing, and he, when he threw it out of bed, he somehow came after it, and now he was attached to it. So what just happened? It's his own leg. <laughs> this leg that he thought was a severed limb of someone else 
was his own leg. So he tries to throw it out of bed and he's like, wait, <laughs> I'm attached to it. What is going on here? Um, so it turns out the brain is this amazing prediction maker. And so, and this, this is what gets amazing to me, is this man had had his leg his entire life. It was part of his body, part of his being, that he recognized, you know, recognized the same way you probably recognize your own limbs. In a matter of 12 hours from some damage, so this condition can happen um, if you, you know, fall and sustain injury to your leg, or if you have any spinal cord injuries, or even further up, any damage. And so what starts to happen is the incoming sensory information of like, this is my leg, stops. But your brain is predicting there's a leg, and here's what the leg should feel like. And when that doesn't match, instead of just letting it go, the brain actually comes up with this story. And it's a totally ridiculous story. Maybe the, maybe the hospital staff put this severed leg to play a trick on me. It, it doesn't make any sense. But it is, the brain is going to create a new narrative based on whatever sensory information and prediction it's making. And I want to give you a moment to think about how this might resonate with your students and the predictions that they're actively making based on the sensory information that's coming to them. So I'll give you a moment to kind of deconstruct that. What are the possible stories, the narratives, that your students might be telling themselves based on their predictions and the incoming sensory information that they're getting from the environment. It feels like hallucinating, doesn't it? But it's not. I mean, this feels super real to the man. Yeah, super real. Yeah, yeah. So these two stories are very extreme. But I share them today. It's very unlikely that this will happen to any of you or any of your students. But I share them today because like the founding work by CAST, exploring some of these most challenging and unusual stories really deepens our insights and understandings in ways that can really benefit everyone. So by learning that the tongue can actually start to deliver sensory information about balance, helped us to understand the brain plasticity, just how malleable and flexible the brain can really be. And that's benefited all of us. Now that we know about brain plasticity, we're able to know that what our students think they have and don't have can change. Cheryl was able to learn how to stand, something they absolutely said would not happen based on the way she interacted with the environment. I don't know about you all, as educators, that blew me away. We have the power to control our environments and the interactions our students have in our environments, and that will change their brains. So in learning about Cheryl, we're deepening our own learning and understanding about ourselves. The last story I want to tell you, I was actually thinking about myself the other day as I was typing. Are any of you typing? How many of you spent a lot of time typing? <laughs> so this is actually called a fused finger syndrome, where sometimes individuals who are moving their fingers so quickly, this can happen a lot with musicians, um, the brain actually starts, the, so the brain is an energy hog, it uses a ton of energy, so any way it can start to become more efficient, it says let's get more efficient. So when you're moving really quickly, your fingers, the brain starts to say, you know what? Every time you're moving your pointer finger, you're also moving your third finger, your middle finger, let's just fuse them together, I'll make it more efficient, and we'll just start to move them together. And sometimes it even happens for three fingers. So you can imagine for a typist, or for a musician, this would be devastating, right? To have all three, and it seems unbelievable. So based on what I've just shared, what you're learning today about the brain or the you know, background that you've brought, what treatment do you recommend to someone who's had this fused finger syndrome happen? What treatment would you recommend? Knowing brain plasticity, what would you recommend they do? You're doing it. You start to retrain this finger is different from this finger. You give it sensory touch, you outline it, you, um, you do any, you try to move them again to retrain your brain. This finger is different from this finger is different from this finger. So it can happen in just a matter of weeks 
what we're doing will change the neurobiology of our brains in ways that are sometimes completely unbelievable, defy our expectations. So any questions with that? Again, I know. So you can see how I got hooked on neuroscience. I very quickly was like, I like this stuff. And I see immediate implications for our classroom practice because our students' brains can change. How powerful is that? Um, and then the last thing I want to share is just that, so within our brain, we have over 86 billion neurons. How many of you have heard this before? And I want to show you the power of, neuro, of uh, UDL, I think, because I thought, I know that's a really big number, but I need a different representation of that number because I don't get how big that is. So I started to look for other representations of 86 billion, and I got to 1 billion. If we take single dollar bills and stack them up to the International Space Station, we get to 1 billion. We've got to get to 86 billion, plus each of those 86 billion can have 10,000 connections. <gasps> I need another representation. I don't know about you all, but when Brian Dean was standing up there today with the sand dunes image, I wanted to hop up there and tell you all this, because this was actually in my slide deck. <laughs> and it turns out, if you try to think about the number of grains of sand on this planet Earth, let your imagination go. Where do you see sand? The desert? The beach? Sand dunes? Where's that? Your backyard? Every single, imagine now, all these, the entire ocean floor. Now we're starting to get to the number of possible connections inside our little skulls. Inside of every one of your students' skulls are that many possible connections. <laughs> right? Amazing. Absolutely incredible. So it does say to me that the simplified models of the brain, we have to let go of. When we see pictures like this, and this is a cross section, the front slice of the brain, and it's pointing to an area of the brain that many of you have probably heard of, the amygdala. You heard of the amygdala? Yep, yep. This is a very simplified view of the brain. The whole brain is active. It's just highlighting one particular part. And it turns out, when we start to look deeper inside and we're able now to see, with current imaging techniques, an active brain, it turns out the amygdala, um, they thought it was just active in fear and emotion. But it turns out it's also active like when we're eating or smelling something or talking to someone. And identical twins, one will have the amygdala active and the other won't. So there are no rules for what's going to be active and what's not going to be active in our students' brains. And so I think, again, for our classrooms, I love these pictures. This is from the Connectome Project. And it's showing the different connectivity of the white matter tracks within the brain. And it's beautiful. So I've linked out. You can see a whole gallery of these pictures they're taking. Um, so learning is not just about lighting up certain pathways in the brain at all. It's about constructing connections and making meaning based on those interactions in the environment. Those interactions in the environment are so critical for students to be able to build their neural connections. And it's up to us to really help determine what will those interactions be. Will they be about engagement and high expectations? Or will it be about compliance and following rules? What will those connections be? And I love this quote. This is one of my favorite neuroscientists, Lisa Feldman Barrett. A great book, How the Emotions Are Made. Brains wire themselves to their surroundings. We have to wonder how our stereotypes or expectations or design of the environment become a physical reality in the brain. And this drum roll is where I think UDL <laughs> really comes in, in an amazing way. Because when we design with UDL, we design across nine different areas of learning that anticipate variability across these nine levels of learning and I made it kind of, oh, it didn't show up as obnoxiously blue as I put it in my slides. Underlying every single one of these UDL guidelines are emotions. Emotions do not just fit in the engagement category. Emotions underlie every single thing that we do. So when we design with UDL in mind, we are designing to support um, learning in every single student, because every student has all nine dimensions of learning in this way. 
So I invite you to continue to share these stories of students who defy your expectations. Just like these neuroscience stories that defied our expectations, share the stories of the students who defied your expectations. So I hear from, t from educators often, oh my goodness, when I added picture directions with the text, that student worked independently for the entire class period and hadn't done that before. Right? It's incredible. It's empowering. When I gave the student the choice of what to write the persuasive essay about, they wrote five pages, and I had never gotten them to write a paragraph before. Ah, right? These are little things. You're making an audio version, and a student who wasn't able to comprehend text because print was the barrier all of a sudden comprehends way beyond your wildest expectations. UDL doesn't look magical. It's in those little moments, but it's in those little moments that we facilitate the interaction of our students in our environment, and they will defy our expectations, I'll argue, every single time. So um, the impact may seem small, but it leads students on a road to learning without limits. So thank you all so much. Go do it. <laughs>